Good afternoon to everybody. It's a great pleasure for me to uh, introduce you Luca Cavalli Sforza. Uh, we are bound by friendship that lasts for over 40 years, 40 years of friendship, 40 years also of some form of scientific collaboration without ev almost ever publishing a, a paper together. We only have one, one paper together, <laughs> published in 1968. Uh, but uh, the collaboration went on nonetheless, uh, more or less uninterruptedly for all this time. Uh, uh, Luca Cavalli Sforza has a, a, a very unique uh, scientific history as well as personal history. But in, uh, he graduated in, in medicine uh, in, uh, in Pavia and then uh, uh, as soon as, he, uh, or during, during his graduation, he went, uh, he met Professor Adriano Buzzati Traverso, who uh, was the founder of genetics, really, in Italy, and also of so much of molecular biology later in Italy. And uh, with uh, uh, Buzzati, he began to work in, in genetics in the most advanced way. And uh, he didn't uh, study genetics in, in a, a, any, uh, would say, uh, common organism. He started working with, with bacteria, and he was, I would say, th probably the first person, the first who identified uh, the fact that uh, also bacteria exchange genetic material, which means also bacteria practice sex in their own way. And uh, se sexuality of, of bacteria was really uh, a, a, big, a big discovery. It was made in, in, also in other uh, in unicellular organisms like Neurospora crassa by Beadle and Tatum, more or less at the same time, and in, in coli, in, in the same bacterium in which uh, uh, Luca was working by Joshua Lederberg in the, in the United States. But Joshua Lederberg, who was a very good friend of Luca as well as mine, uh, he was always uh, admitted always that Luca was the first to discover uh, sexuality in bacteria. Uh, the, these uh, uh, bacterial genetics uh, deserved a, a Nobel Prize to Biddle, Tatum, and, and Lederberg in 1958. But uh, Luca went on, and uh, he, much of his, so his work, the, the fact that he could do genetic exchanges in E. coli, in, in a bacterium, was, gave an enormous boost to molecular biology in the very early years, in the uh, early and glorious years of the beginning of molecular biology. And uh, Luca gave also an important contribution to that. For instance, in, in the study of the genetic code in particular, he showed, he demonstrated that uh, streptomycin introduces uh, ambiguity uh, in, the, uh, in the genetic code. So it's very uh, uh, papers which are classic. But his real interest was, was a different one. His real interest was uh, the genetics of human population, the genetics of the human species. And uh, he began uh, as soon as he could as soon as possible in studying the distribution of genes in the human population and see how he could see the relationship uh, among the different uh, populations of the world by studying the frequency of the genes. Now, doing that in the late 50s or, or, or even early 60s was quite a problem because at that time the only genes available were very few, were uh, essentially blood groups and very few protein markers, protein genes. Still from that, the, here comes the, the other talent uh, of Luca. He was able to apply to this, uh, start to this scanty data, a uh, very refined uh, mathematical analysis. And in this way, he was able to establish the very first maps of relationship among the different uh, human populations. And these maps also correspond somehow to the history of, hum of the human populations. I remember when I arrived in, in Pavia, uh, we had met before, but we arrived in Pavia in the uh, late 60s, in the second half of the 60s, and in the, in the department, in the history of, of Pavia, there were some three-dimensional plastic maps trying to, that were already indicating how the different populations of the world uh, were related. Well, uh, he brought on this work for uh, many decades with a lot of refined mathematical analysis. Uh, uh, Luca has, uh, is uh, contrary to the great majority, if not almost the almost totality of biologists, is a, is a very, good, uh, very good at applying refined mathematics in his work. And, and, uh, and, and thanks to the great progress that we have had uh, on, the on the genes, he made 
First of all, he published a, a, an important treatise on the genetics of human populations uh, in the uh, 70s, which was still considered today as the, the textbook for human, genetics of human population. But by refining continuously this analysis of the relationship and therefore of the history of human populations, he arrived to publish in 1994 this uh, uh, magnum opus, which is uh, the uh, uh, history and geography on human genes, in which uh, he gave the very first picture of all the history of human populations based on the, on a, on, on the basis of genetic data and uh, uh, refined mathematical analysis. He really has invented a new science. By the way, this comes better in Italian, una, una scienza nuova. He has really, uh, really created una scienza nuova. Uh, and and the, the, his, the study of uh, the genomes, of human genomes, of the uh, human uh, genetics in, uh, on a world basis is uh, marked by, is divided in two parts before the Cavalli's book in 94 and afterwards. From that time, from 1994 uh, onwards, uh, all the uh, work which is going on and the incredible progress which is done now in defining in more in detail all the structure of the human populations is given, is based on Cavalli's Forza's work and Cavalli's Forza is the, in, uh, so how do you say, the beacon that uh, 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 gives light to all the subsequent studies and the inspirer of all the studies which are very powerful today, very important today, uh, not so much on the study of the one human genome, but on the study of all the human genomes, the, because the diversity of human genomes is the most in, interesting uh, feature, in fact, of, of uh, human genetics. Uh, this uh, study, of course, has brought him in inevitably to see the interplay of uh, this, the genetic and biological study with uh, the most typical feature of the human species, that is the importance of culture. And so he has been able to show how these two uh, very es essential elements of, huma of, of humankind interplay with each other. I won't say any more because, anything more because I'll just uh, take your time. Uh, we thank you very much, Luca, for being here. And we are all uh, uh, very uh, waiting uh, to, to hear more on, on your more recent studies. Consider that uh, Luca is, uh, we are discussing now, he's full of new ideas and new programs always along these lines. Luca, please. Mm. <laughs> well, it's a great pleasure to be here in this beautiful place and excellent university, which has always been, for a long time now, the best in Italy. So it's a pleasure to be invited and talk to you. And uh, you heard wonderful things about me. And you have to distinguish things that come from a very good friend, like Arturo. And he, is, uh, he was wonderful, it was naturally. But uh, well, uh, I uh, just uh, I always recommend to be very objective in uh, weighing <laughs> judgments you think about people, even if it is about me. But anyhow, I'm very, I'm very grateful to you for what you said. Uh, let me um, tell you the thing that has interested me in uh, human evolution is the possibility of using genetic data that were not used at all at the beginning. Although there were ideas that one could make some statements from seeing, for instance, that the Rh negative gene was particularly frequent in a population in the north of west of Spain, the Basques. And uh, that uh, generated an interest. In fact, the person who was working on that was a professor with whom I worked very early, R.A. Fisher, who happens to be the greatest statistician of the last century and also one of the greatest geneticists. So I suppose I caught, I caught the bug from him. I really liked uh, very much with this sort of thing. At the beginning, I was a bacteriologist, but um, I I got a, a, a little tired of bacteria when uh, things became so, so big and noisy that the whole world was working on genetics of bacteria. And uh, I was in Italy in a very small place 
And I thought that fighting alone against the rest of the world was a little bit too much. And I thought, well, maybe I should look around and see if I find something that I like better. In principle, that is very def often done by English science, that every scientist that finds looks very carefully for his own niche. And then, having found it, works at that for all his life, essentially. And I suppose I've been doing more or less the same, except I kept doing what I was, was doing at the beginning on, uh, on, on sex and bacteria. I'll mention a few more things about it later. Uh, however, uh, I just started, I had a great uh, suggestion from a student of mine. In fact, there was a time, the first course of genetics I gave was in the Parma University in 1952. And I had two excellent students. In the, so usually there's one excellent student per course, but I had two. One was um, Danilo Mainardi, who many of you must have heard, or have seen or heard. He, he was a very good uh, student of behavior, in animal behavior. And uh, the other was uh, um, Antonio Moroni, who was a very good ecologist. He was the founder of the Society of Ecology in Italy. And uh, Antonio Moroni is a priest, and uh, he, he knew about the fact that uh, priests collect uh, data of interest for genetics, which are parish books, where, which, are made, which record all marriages, all deaths, and all uh, births or baptisms, which is almost the same. Uh, and, uh, the, and also, they, they do studies of consanguineous marriages, which are peculiar from a genetic point of view. And he told me they might be interesting. So I, I took a careful look, and I discovered they were indeed very interesting. And the fact that having a priest working with me made it very, very simple, because he had been teaching in the seminar all the priests of the Parma um, diocese were his students. So he just told them, you know, that will, they will come, I will come with my professor and next Sunday and we will collect blood from your parishioners. And so we went there, we, we took blood in, in the sacristy and uh, it, we usually had always, uh, more or less always enough that it was uh, perfectly. And so we did a, a very careful study of a part of the diocese which is the Valley of Parma. That was the first real work. And that real work, I studied uh, the relative importance of random genetic drift and uh, natural selection, which are two forces that tend to create differences among populations, apart from mutation. That brings me to the first slide. And the first slide is the list of for the four major evolutionary factors. I, I tr I'll try to introduce a fifth one a little later. But these are, can you, can you read that? Yeah, shook, shook. Is this for going forward? Push, no, this is to push if you want to, to use the... Oh, to use the laser. Well, the generation of all di genetic diversity is mutation. There are many types of mutations from the one affecting the smallest unit of DNA you remember probably, or if you must have heard through some of the newspapers, uh, the genetic patrimony, what is carried on from a parent to child is DNA, and that determines what is inherited. And uh, um, the, the DNA is made of three billion nucleotides, subdivided in 23 chromosomes in humans. And uh, the um, smallest unit is the nucleotide, one, out of three million, three billion uh, units forming a, one genome. We get one genome from the father, one genome from the mother. The only little difference between them is that uh, from the father, males get uh, the Y chromosome and the X from the mother, and uh, females get only X chromosomes, two X chromosomes. We have, uh, for, um, um, we have always Two, apart from rare instances where something goes wrong with consequences, we always have two, chromos two pair individuals of each chromosome. We have a, each chromosome is represented in pairs. And uh, so we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, total, total 40, 46. Now, uh, but the, the chromosomes may change 
the smallest change is the substitution of one nucleotide with another. Now, the nucleotides that form DNA are four. You may have heard of them, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine, A, C, G, T. So let's just consider them as letters, and let's consider a chromosome like a, a book with 23 chapters, and each chapter is made of a long, uninterrupted list of nucleotides, which are so a writing in four letters instead of those two dozens that we use in other languages, at least in, in um, Europe. Now, the mm, uh, substitution of one nucleotide with another is essentially an error of copy. When we have a child, we donate to him a copy of our genome, not our genome, but just a copy of it. That copy may have errors. Like computers make errors, so cells, bodies make errors. If the error happens in a cell that is going to f pass the genome of one individual to a child, that will be inherited in all descendants. And that is a permanent change which is found in all descendants. Now, what is the frequency of this change? It's very low. It's of the order of order 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 8 per nucleoside. Nucleotide changes are not the only ones. Others also occur, maybe more rare or more frequent. But uh, the most frequent ones are nucleot uh, single nucleotides. And sometimes they are more frequent than that. And sometimes maybe we don't know very much. But anyhow, mutation is rare. It is important that it is rare. It is important that it is spontaneous. We have a, a very good experiments show that it is spontaneous. They happen. In, uh, in ways that uh, uh, I, I'm not going to speak about that, but uh, there are experiments that show they are spontaneous. Uh, the, um, in fact, I, I've written a book which is called Perché la scienza, and there is a chapter dedicated to that, specifically to the experiment, why that uh, the, we can say the mutation is spontaneous. Um, the other thing, and that, as you all know, I'm sure, was the uh, product of the mind of uh, Charles Darwin and also of his contemporary Wallace, and its natural selection. Now, what I would want to insist on is that natural selection is not something that may or may not exist. It's simply necessary, automatic, absolutely automatic, in any process of self-reproduction. And life is nothing but a process of self-reproduction. There are other processes of self-reproduction other than life, but uh, life is perhaps the most important one in the world. And the self-reproduction of living organisms uh, in the, uh, needs a copying process. The copying process may involve errors with our mutations. But also, it involves natural selection. Because when you may have children, you may have one, two, three, five children, 100 children, 1,000 children, depending on what organism you are. Uh, flies have hundreds of, uh, maybe even thousands of, of children during the life of one of them. And uh, you have, may have zero children. If you have zero children, your DNA is lost. It may be survived through DNA copy of your, like yours, that has been passed to your brothers or your cousins or whatever. But in principle, the fact that there is a variation in the number of children is important. Now, the number of children that count are not those that are born, are those that survive to have more children. And that is the measure of what uh, uh, Fisher called Darwinian fitness. The fitness as Darwin. Well, fitness is a word that indicates adaptation. Somebody fitter is more adapted to the environment. Well, and uh, some reason why natural selection makes difference is some individuals may be more apt to live in one specific environment, but natural selection is always defined with respect to a specific environment. And that specific environment may involve everything else that there is around, other organisms, other people, other, those same species, uh, our parents and uh, even our children. So that is what natural selection is, but you cannot think that natural selection is there or is not there. Natural selection is an automatic process because those who have more children that survive to maturity are going to spread their genome. And the reason usually, usually is that uh, 
Then the genome of the parents is fitter and that of the children therefore is fitter if the environment continues to be the same. But there are also reasons of chance whereby some people have more children than others. And uh, those reasons, which are not nothing to do with natural selection, just a matter of chance, once you throw, uh, uh, you throw a coin in the air, you don't know if it's going to fall uh, heads or tails. That's the approach, right? So that is an example of a chance phenomenon. And uh, uh, all I inheritance uh, of two things <laughs> Uh, involves a chance phenomena like just uh, very similar to throwing a coin in the air. With one, uh, the, the effect, if you have studied Mendel's laws, there's always a throwing of a coin at every birth, uh, more or less, in, in ch uh, the children of heterozygotes, because heterozygotes have uh, more, uh, two types of genes, a slightly different one from the other. And uh, there's the same chance that uh, one is passed uh, or the other in every sperm or egg that is formed. So it's exactly like the coin experiment, throwing a coin. Now, the chance of fluct fluctuations, which are rather uh, uh, difficult mathematically, uh, determine a variation which is called random genetic drift. I like to give one example that was probably, that is probably true of random genetic drift. If you um, look at uh, ABO blood groups, you may have heard of ABO blood group. You, you may even know your ABO blood group. People are either O or A or B or AB. When you pass a gene, it's either O or A or B. Now, the frequencies of ABO in the whole world, if we take all the human species, there's maybe 55 or 60 percent of all genes. The A's are 30%, 25%, and the, the B's are less, it's to some, something to 100%. Now, practically in the whole world, there are variations between uh, people, but the most extreme one was found among American Indians. Among American Indians, um, you find that in the south of America, there's only O genes. There's no A, no B. In uh, the um, north of America, there is almost o, only O, except in some part of it in the north way east, there's also A. Why did that happen? Well, it was very probably an accident. It might have been another story. We are not certain. We don't, we don't have enough data for saying. But one possibility is that the individuals who entered into America they entered through the Bering Strait. It was a very difficult passage, and very few did it. There was a time when there was land instead of sea that made it a little easier, but it was very cold, and uh, it, uh, it, it certainly was risky and so on. Well, suppose that only 10 peoples managed to pass. Well, we have cases in small islands in which 10 peoples have been enough to populate an island and form a population that grew. Uh, doubling every generation, which is enormous uh, rate of reproduction. So even 10 individuals might generate all American Indians. Well, the chance that those 10 individuals who are all blood group O, starting with 60% of all blood groups, is, uh, is quite uh, substantial. And if it didn't happen in the first generation, it might have happened in the second generation, that the, the, if there was an A or B gene in that small group of fellows that entered into America, then you would find that uh, it, again, a, and a or B is lost and only O remains. Well, and in the many generations through that passed between the peopling of America, America was peopled at least 15,000 years ago. And so there were many generations. And it took uh, three or 4,000 years, they were very fast, to arrive to Chile. 11,000 years ago, you already find in South Chile that there are some humans. And uh, there may have been more than one migration. Now, but it's possible that uh, ABO was simplified extremely. There was a loss of genetic diversity. Everybody's O in the south, and there's O and only O and a little A in the north, because, there were, because of random genetic drift, which is just the chance fluctuations of gene frequencies. 
And uh, why do we think that that is more likely than other hypotheses, which are still considered? Simply the fact that if you look at all the other genes, you find similar situations. That tells you that it's very likely that there was a small group of what we call founders of America. And we have, seen, we have so many examples of populations that have been founded by a very small group, and this has created uh, major events. I'll give you another example. Um, from the genes of uh, Jews who have populated North Europe, it has been concluded there probably was a fairly small group of them that left Rome, probably, where there were Jews in the time of Christ. St. Peter and St. Paul went to uh, Rome because there was a large uh, community there. Rita Levi Montalcini is convinced, has documents that show that her family was there before uh, Peter and Paul uh, came to, to propagate uh, Christianism. And uh, the um, uh, Jews were already in a great number of places at that time. They had already spread, uh, they had, had two, uh, one diaspora and then they had another one in 70 AD. And they had populated a large part of the world already, forming small colonies. Well, a small colony probably left Rome maybe a thousand years ago and settled in Poland and found a good situation there and prospered, multiplied. Now, a population that does well doubles in one generation. And we have had examples of which we have good demography that this can happen. It happened in French Canada. It happened in the island of Christa de Cunha. It happened in the island. Uh, it happened in South Africa uh, with the white population. South Africa went there in 1650 and uh, multiplied at, at that rate. So in, you know, in, that means you multiply 10 times in one century, 100 times in two centuries. 1,000 times in the century, it's very fast. So that uh, even, even a small group can populate rapidly a large area. Uh, now, um, the, w among these Jews that went into North Europe, there were, uh, it looks like 50% of, of those who were, are there or were there and then went to the States at the time of Hitler. Uh, 50% of them come from four women. Now, some, one of those four women had some diseases that are recessive, so they are not seen if they are transmitted only from one parent. So it, the pop, that, even if the population was growing, you didn't see any case of those diseases. When there were many people, then there were also many who had inherited a gene from only one parent, which are called heterozygotes. And they married together, and then, then the gene would come out. So uh, Jews are the population that has been mostly studied, best studied, essentially, genetically, because Jews have many doctors, and uh, excellent doctors. In uh, Stanford Medical School, where, I, where I'm teaching, has almost 50% of the professors are, are Jews because uh, they, uh, they've had, the, they, for a while, there was a rule in New York that they didn't want in the you know, New York universities more than 3% Jews or 3% of Italian. That discrimination disappeared, fortunately, after the war. And uh, Jews have always been doctors, great doctors. Uh, Maimonides was also a philosopher, but he had a, an office in Baghdad and one also in Cordoba. So, you know, uh, a thousand, or 800 years, 900 years ago. So at that time, it was not so easy to commute between Baghdad and, uh, and Cordoba. But he was so famous that he, he could do it. So, um, so Jews are better known genetically than most other populations. And there are several diseases which are rare, which are the product of one mutation of which there was one carrier who, a heterozygous, so the disease would not be noticed, among some of the founders. So this is what we call founder effect, and it's very important. It's uh, noticed uh, easily whenever we study an island that has been founded in historically known terms. And, uh, uh, and that, uh, that, will, that population will always be a little different from all others because of the chances in the number of carriers of some disease that you find at the beginning. 
and it's true of every population. It's true of French Canadians, South Africans, etc. Except that Jews are the pe peculiar. Some some groups were founded by particularly few people, and so the effect. Now drift therefore tends to kill genetic diversity because if you have two genes at the beginning, uh, which is frequent, and I'll come in a minute to tell you how often it, that happens, and then uh, if you have two genes in a population, then if the population is very small or goes through founder effects or many founder effects maybe, then uh, it will lose diversity. It will lose one of those two alias. There remains only one. The population for that nucleotide is identical. All individuals are identical. And uh, that loss of genetic diversity is maybe a serious loss. Maybe a serious loss because there may be more recessive genes coming out as, uh, and if they are deleterious, then they, they are, um, uh, there, are more, there will be more diseases of that type in the population. And uh, in general, heterozygotes are at an advantage um, Darwin discovered hybrid vigor, which was already known to. Uh, it discovered it, but it made experiments showing that if you cross two pure lines, which are very pure genetically, because they have been bred father, mother, uh, husband, wife, or father and daughter, etc., for many generations. So they are extremely similar. Made of individuals that are very similar genetically, mostly homozygous. Well, those, uh, those, cell, those lines, we're called pure lines or inbred lines, tend to lose fertility, lose vigor, lose uh, survival skills. If you cross them, then the population of hybrids flourishes. So today, we eat mostly corn that is hybrid because it's so much better than hybrid than maize from, from pure lines. And we also eat only hybrids of wheat, and now it's been spread from corn, which was first done uh, in, in 1916 or something like that. Now this is spread to animals uh, of all sorts. and quindi. Now hybrid vigor is very much exploited, except in humans, because in humans, in fact, in fact many humans prefer to be racist. Think that a pure race is what you want. Pure race is an idiocy. It's impossible. And it's an idiocy, because then you lose vigor. And probably, uh, it's, uh, it's true that uh, it's always advantageous to be what other people would call a bastard. You know, it's just better to have genes of different origin in, inside you. Um, anyhow, this, this is drift, and a drift that tends to eliminate heterozygotes. It makes you pure racist, and therefore you lose diversity and you lose vitality. Now, migration is the last phenomenon, and then I've already used too much time to give you the four phenomena, but then I'll have to be a little faster. But these are really the foundations of evolution. If you know these four factors, you can make predictions in evolution. And they are almost perfect, except that I've not mentioned one fifth factor that I'll mention a little later. Which, but I will advance to you what it is. It's called recombination and segregation. The fact that when two individuals marry, that generate, brings together two different genomes, generates diversity and brings in advantage because it can bring in hybrid vigor and chances of surviving new situations that have not been experienced before. So let me go now to um, the next. So these are the two four, four quantities with which we make all predictions of evolution apart from special cases. And uh, let me come to uh, two very special genes which lack the possibility of recombination and migration. They are genes that are on two chromosomes. Y chromosomes that determine sex. All males in this hall have y, a Y chromosome. And all, no, no, no females has a Y chromosome. But we, uh, women have two X chromosomes, and he, we men have only one. So we are XY. Now, the Y chromosome is very short, uh, and most of it is like a single, a single. Uh, so it is inherited only in, uh, while all the other um, uh, genes and chromosomes are always one from the father, one from the mother. And that makes the 
pedigree is very complicated because from every individual they depart two lines and go to a father and a mother, and the father goes to two fathers and mothers, and therefore four grandfathers, and the uh, next generation you have eight. Well, if there's some constant we need to be less than eight, but uh, there's still an enormous network that is formed if you do a genealogy for the majority of genes, which are in all chromosomes. Not in the Y chromosomes. In the Y chromosomes, it's very simple. You have only one parent from each individual. And one thing, strange thing happens, which statistics tells us it's exactly right, and that is that uh, if you go back to the Y chromosome, you make a tree, you build a tree to make, to see where you can go. You always go back to just one person. There has always been one single ancestor for Y chromosomes. We could call it Adam, right? And uh, we can even date when it is now. I'm going, uh, this, the, what, what it says here in the slide is essentially what I'm telling you, but except for that one thing before I leave that. There's a quantity called mitochondrial DNA, which is the same for women. So men have this line that tells only about paternal descendants and um, uh, why, uh, mitochondrial DNA instead tells you everything about maternal descendants because mitochondria are little bacteria, descendants of bacteria that entered in our body over a billion years ago and uh, became, lost a lot of their genes, a very small chromosome reduced to 16,600 uh, nucleotides, so very much smaller than the, all the other chromosomes. And, but mitochondria are like bacteria, they reproduce like bacteria, they divide into two, and two into four and so on. And uh, they are transmitted only by the egg. The mitochondria that are in sperm are important for the sperm motility, but they are lost because uh, they are in the tail of the sperm. The sperm, you probably have an idea how, how a sperm is made, it's just a little ball with a long tail. Well, the mitochondria are at the top of the tail in the sperm. They give the energy to the tail for move because mitochondria are producing a, producers of energy from sugars. And uh, uh, they are the most efficient producers of energy that we have. If we lose them, we are lost. Uh, and, uh, uh, but the mitochondria come from the egg cells and come from the mother. So the mitochondria have a chromosome which tells us everything about the mother. And also for mitochondria, you find that all mitochondria go back to one. You could call it Eve, right? Now, it happens that if we date Adam and Eve, they have not lived together. One is 125,000 years old, and the other is 175,000 years old. And the reason why we have this difference is that probably for a long time, and still it's true, men tend to have more than one wife on average. Polygamy of a type polyandry, it's also called, the reverse, uh, uh, polygyny, I'm sorry. Polyandry would be the reverse. Polyandry is the case in which one woman marries, has many husbands at the same time. And that exists, but it's rare. It's found in India and Tibet, rarely. But the majority of the world uh, has pol some polygamy. And the average is uh, 1.3, 1.4 wives per man. Well, that is statistically ex expected to generate just the difference between the dates of Adam and Eve that we observe. So just one of those cases that is very nice that uh, mathematics is so simple. And, uh, and it all depends on the fact that uh, you always go back to only one for a very simple reason. There are families which have zero children. So those Y chromosomes and, X -chrom and uh, mitochondria are lost. And uh, uh, others, others will supply mitochondria. But and Y chromosomes. However, if you go on and on, there are always 10% or so of families that have zero children for one reason or the other. Maybe because they are born, but they don't survive to maturity to have children themselves and so on. Well, for those, and those, those circumstances, the eventually, all mitochondria left are one that descend from one woman, Eve, right? And uh, there was at the beginning an error. Some of the geneticists found that it was really so that, was a, that we all descend from only one woman. The reality is we are sure that uh, the really where many women at the time of 175,000 years ago when with the approximate date of the life of 
this Eve, right? But the only mitochondria that survive today are from just one woman. That is what we call Eve. But there were probably 1,000 or 10,000 women who also had mitochondria, which are different from that mitochondria. And therefore, today, they are lost, those other mitochondria. It's a matter of chance. Chance is more important than you think. It's something that many philosophers, and especially Catholic theologians, hate. And uh, I, I think that uh, uh, they don't realize two things. That chance, first of all, is to some extent a matter of ignorance of us. Ours. So that there are things that in practice behave as chance. Uh, we could predict the events that led to one or other thing. But the, and there are so many causes. When there are many causes that cause an event and can go one way or the other, then it's likely to have a phenomenon that we study as chance, because we know to study how to study it if it is chance. But uh, if, we, if we wanted to follow every little thing that happened, we would look that there is a, a set of causes that have determined them, but so many that in practice it looks exactly like chance. Now, mathematicians have learned to predict chance. There are theorems that tell us exactly what happens about some fundamental things that are due, are, can be described as due to chance. And therefore, we have to learn probability calculus in order to understand evolution. And we find that chance is very important and very useful for us. So then now let me go to really to some data. And the data, these data are uh, chromosomes, Y chromosomes that could be distinguished using uh, a few hundred genes that we knew, or nucleotides, individual nucleotides actually, that were varied, were different among men. So we could always say, and we could distinguish on the basis of a few hundred nucleotides, at least a uh, uh, hundred types or so that are represented here. For instance, one had uh, one nucleotide, you know, if we have uh, A or C or T or G, one nucleotide was A, and then if you look at another nucleotide, you find a different one. Then a combination of haplotypes in one individual, in one Y chromosome, an individual, uh, of one, excuse me, a combination of all markers uh, that are variable in one individual uh, generates what we call haplotypes or groups, which are uh, combinations of genes and uh, of, of the various forms of genes. Now, those that you see here are uh, 20 major combinations, approximately, a little less, that were described some time ago that were given a letter. So the first on the left is A. And it was possible to reconstruct the tree. And the little, no, I can even use, I have no problem, because I can, I can leave there, because I have. That guy there is Adam, right? Now. The partition into two groups is because there was one mutation that generated a difference between this individual and that, one nucleotide, nucleotide that changed. And then here, another nucleotide changed and generated distinction by those. Now, all the numbers you see are mutations that we have recognized. And some of the branches have a, a greater number. In fact, we would expect that every branch in the simplest conditions has exactly more or less with a cha random chance. Um, different number of mutations. We have differences because we examine different number of individuals just because we didn't find enough of one or the other. Uh, now, every, every individual here, here there are many individuals that are exactly identical with respect to these genes. There may be one or many, depends, but uh, they can, we can distinguish individuals of this type by individuals of this type by examining all the all the mutations, all, all the nucleotides, specific nucleotides, on the Y chromosome. Now, the color indicates different haplogroups that all have one common ancestor way back. And uh, if we now look at uh, the same thing uh, without, you see here, we made these long, uh, uh, these long branches to emphasize the differences between the haplogroups and gave them different color. But uh, if we just represent the mutations, 
One of those that has particularly as many mutations here is long. Others that have had fewer mutations are short. The length now is proportional to mutations. We would expect all the branches to be equally long. There are some differences. We are in the process of explaining them. Most of them are due to ascertainment bias, the fact that some are due to a few individuals. The color of the groups here indicate the continent in which it is, and this is important. This is Adam, the first branch, gave rise to individuals that are all in Africa. That is called haplotype A. The, the, the first division separates these from the rest. Here, there's another separation due to other mutations, and here they all, these people are still in Africa. Now, it's interesting that these are all individuals who are um, in a part of the Africa that the archaeologists know is the one that uh, was occupied, the only one that was occupied by modern humans like us over 50,000 years ago. And it was what we call the Rift Valley that started in uh, Kenya or maybe Sudan. Sudan, I would intend to include Sudan even it's not the Reef Valley, because uh, we'll, we'll have, we have a few of those there, those individuals today. And then you come down, you come down. The Reef Valley is the luscious part of Africa with beautiful lakes and, and rivers and so on. And so it was populated early. And uh, they all, all, all those types are the latest, and they are still there. But they are a minority. And uh, they are what we call, for instance, Bushmen, Hottentots, uh, Hadza, and others, tribes that speak languages that are also among the oldest. Now, this other group is still in Africa uh, after the color, the red color. This is Africa, you see. And these are all African pygmies, who are also, like these, are still, or were until a few one or two generations ago, hunters-gatherers, which is the oldest economy in the world, which means that they ate, well, they, would also, they also would use uh, uh, fish, so, um, but they used products, wild products. They used natural products only, and it is only 11,000 years ago that a major economic change took place, and that was that food began to be produced. Now, you can produce plants, you can produce animals. Those are called agriculture, animal breeding. The two things were done together. Obviously, people got the idea, we can use, artificially do, reproduce those animals that are scarce. There's not enough deer. We, why should we uh, be hungry? Let's try to breed deer. Deer, deer is very difficult to breed. But uh, cattle was, poss was possible. And goat and, uh, goat and sheep were the, the easiest uh, animals to breed. And, the, and swine were easy. And uh, after those, um, there came chicken and others, several others, not very many. And they are those who still now we eat as meat. And uh, the same happened for plants. Plants were uh, artificially bred and a great number of varieties produced. These two things happened together. The oldest uh, uh, experiments of that kind, which were fruitful, were in the Middle East. In fact, they were between Syria and Turkey, exactly there, 11,500 years ago, one archaeological site. And then all the other sites uh, after that are around, both Middle East and Turkey. But also in China, there was, of course, every time there was a growth of the local plants and whenever possible, of the local animals. But the best animals were in uh, the Middle East. And according to Jared Diamond, I think he's right, uh, the, that is really the reason why the Europeans were so uh, as, as, as much richer than the rest of the world today. Because they were the first to develop meat, uh, uh, artificial food uh, like meat. And, uh, and the only reason was that only there, in, in the Middle East and, 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 and Turkey, there were animals that could be easily domesticated. And all other animals are very difficult to domesticate, and uh, they all came later. And, uh, and some of them, for instance, elephants, 
Um, Af uh, Indian elephants are more easily domesticated than African elephants. So in Africa, they were used only for war by Hannibal very late. And instead, in India, they've been used for a longer time and are still used today as animals for, uh, as, as, uh, for carrying big weights. Now, this is, so we are, we are only here. This shows that the third branch, then we have to go down because there came too many branches because the population is now spread over the whole world from Africa. Up to here, we are in between 100,000 and 50,000 years ago. And then about at that time, people started to go into Asia, yellow, even in Europe, blue, and, uh, but uh, they are still mostly in Africa. And then they start now growing in Asia, where there were other older men, but they didn't mix because there was a complete difference of maturity and uh, development and uh, socioeconomic uh, customs. So there was no mixture with, uh, it's, called, it's another species. It probably, maybe they wouldn't have had uh, fertile progeny, which is what happens usually when different species originate because the, their DNAs are no more compatible enough to give rise to progeny that is fertile. Now you can see that here there are many Europeans arising. And at some stage, we also have some Americans who are very late because uh, the entry to America was the last step in the expansion to the whole world. But the archaeologists have a, a very good idea of what the expansion might have been, although one would like to have more information than we do have. Now, that is Y chromosome. Now, we expect, of course, that mitochondria must have done the same. I'm sorry, yeah. Now, before, yeah, this is mitochondria. In fact, in mitochondria, you get, the, this is Eve. You can see that uh, Africa is the first. They, some go to Asia. And uh, this is still, all the first branches are Africa, Africa, Africa. Then Asia, 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 Asia. Then Europe. And then the rest, you know. And um, so the, the, you get a very similar story from, but not identical, because migrations of women and men may be different. Now, sorry. This is, if you take now the tree of Y chromosome and plot it in order to represent where probably the mutations that are at the top of, of th th these mutations, the first there, the first there, the first there. And uh, of course, they're always later and later and later. And then uh, if you plot those on the, on the world, you get this map. So the origin of here. And uh, first, in the first uh, 50,000, between 100,000 and 50,000 years, Africa is occupied. And uh, then um, after that, uh, there is, uh, people go to, to a a a Asia. And from Asia, they go to Europe. And then they go further in Asia. And from Asia, they go all over. And also, people go to Asia by this route. And this route, probably, here it's depicted as the crow flies but probably they go by uh, boat, because boats had been, must have been invented at that time. And uh, they, uh, they, they were made of uh, uh, trees that were felled and uh, excavated with fire. So this is still how you make a canoe in Africa. Now, this, this is to show, I'm, I'm not going into detail, but this shows the, the types of uh, uh, mitochondria. No, the types of, sorry, the types of uh, Y chromosomes and the types of mitochondria that are represented in the major apple groups. And uh, you can see the, num the circles are the number of individuals that belong to each of those groups, distinguishing uh, Y chromosome and mitochondria. And the color indicates the, um, uh, the continent where they are now. You can see that there is a part of the world, which is here. There, it's almost all in Africa. And they are the oldest in terms of the tree and also in terms of the archaeology. And it's true both, both for mitochondria and for Y chromosome. Now, the rest of the world is here because then 
when it went into Asia, then it had ways to expand and also to grow rapidly because it found essentially an empty, uh, an empty world. And then you see that they still tend to go together somehow. And uh, uh, it's a complicated story that uh, we are um, describing with greater and greater. Now, one way to, to describe this is to have populations from all over the world that you can study repeatedly so with very many ge different genes and so on. So this is something we started with friends in 1997, uh, where uh, I suggested in 91, but it took a lot of time. Uh, you have to have patience if you do these things because uh, novelties are not necessarily liked. And uh, people are st still scared of DNA. And uh, the H, um, the, this HGDP, Human Genome Diversity Project, which I, I suggested in 91, took 11 years to develop. But eventually, we were able to collect with many other colleagues who all donated cultures like those that I had made. Cultures of cells made on indigenous populations. So from America, it's only American Indians. And from Australia, it's only Australian Aborigines, and so on. And uh, they, they were put into a French laboratory. France is more, uh, a little more scared by these sort of novelties than, than, uh, than America. So we put it in, in France. And uh, all research workers can have it. We, we denied the, to, for, for, uh, to profit-making laboratories, essentially pharmaceutical firms, to request them because we are not sure that they, they would start patenting uh, genes and so on, and that would stop research or make it very difficult. So they cannot get uh, the cells and the DNA we distribute only the DNA for the time being. The cells would be very interesting, but we haven't started working with those. We start with, want to work with the DNA. And uh, almost 100 laboratories have already had samples from 1,000 individuals that come from 52 populations. And the 50, uh, the collection is called, and this is where the populations are. The, the circles indicated. You can see we have seven in Europe, about the same in, uh, I'm sorry, seven in Africa, about the same in Europe. This is African, but it looks more, much more like Europeans. Uh, Middle East, uh, Turkey, actually Caucasus. Many from Pakistan. We didn't manage any, get any from India because India decided they would, at that time they would not want their DNA to go abroad because they were annoyed with pharmaceutical, not pharmaceutical, but uh, uh, Monsanto and other firms that uh, grew strains of... Uh, Arise in the, from India and then basically charge enormous amounts of money when, the, when India tried to get back their strains bred by Monsanto. They, they, they were requested as exorbitant sums. So they decided they don't send in, in the DNA abroad. Now, this is China. China has been very generous in getting us. Uh, basically, uh, <laughs> these are all friends of mine. Uh, in Pakistan and China, and, uh, and uh, these are some of the um, cells we have. In America, in, in the U.S., we avoided collecting cell lines because uh, the American Indians are still very angry for uh, the treatment they have had in the last centuries, and the, you cannot blame them, you know, because they really had some hard, tough time, and so they, they didn't want to... Uh, their DNA to be used for any scientific purpose. So you do meet these problems, but uh, they are strange. There are people who are not at all afraid. In fact, uh, we have learned a lot about genome from just one person. You may remember to have read in, in the newspapers that the genome study was made by a, an American government group uh, led by Francis Collins in in the whole world, that was very long and expensive, expensive uh, very expensive, uh, cost, cost a lot of money. And uh, then uh, Craig Venter, uh, who is uh, an industrialist, decided to do it. And uh, while the Jim Collins used, uh, uh, Jim Collins used DNAs from different people, so you couldn't tell who gave what DNA. Craig Winter did not have fear and said, 
I give my own DNA. And almost all the DNA is examined as his. Now, the fact that he did that allows us to make, have one quantity which we have never been able to measure before. And that is how many nucleotides in DNA vary between two chromosomes. Now, because, um, you see, the genome of Francis Collins has been done on only one genome, which comes, sections come from one individual, uh, but it is only half an individual, that genome, because every, we get always two genomes, one from the father, one from the mother. Now, Craig Minter made a whole genome, uh, his whole genome. He studied the, both the father and mother contribution. And so we, we now know what is the difference between in one individual uh, between the father and the mother contribution. And you may have learned it on the newspapers. It's 90, 99.5% of all the nucleotides, the 3 billion nucleotides, are identical in the contribution from the father and the mother. And 0.5%, uh, uh, which is 1 out of 200, are instead different. But there are no more usually than, well, you can, you can only have two two individuals, two, two different forms of a gene when you study just two genomes, right? And um, that is actually much more general than that. We know that, although we don't have very good data yet. However, the, uh, the fact uh, that uh, we have three billions, but one of 200 out of them is different between the father and mother of one of us, tells us that uh, the genes that are variable at the level of nucle single nucleotides when you call a gene a single nucleotide, which we now don't call a gene. A gene is a longer piece of a chromosome now. Many nucleotides, even millions of nucleotides, that have a specific function. This is what we call a gene. And we now know that genes are much fewer than we thought. Anyhow, this is another story. It's more complicated to speak about that. Uh, and we, haven't, we don't understand it completely. Anyhow, the, out of those 3 billion genes, those, those, those that can vary for a single nucleotide, a single nucleotide can vary, are 15 million. So, and uh, that difference is calculated on one individual. His parents were both born in Great Britain. That does not make much of a difference, I can tell you that, because we'll see it. Anyhow, that also will matter in some, to some extent, but uh, it, it, it doesn't matter as much as you might expect, because after all, the British look so different from the non-British if you compare them with uh, blacks from here and uh, um, orientals, etc. So, um, now this, this is the location of the, of the HGDP that can be analyzed, and I'm going to show you hmm. I'm not going to read this, I prefer to. Yes, this is a method. Well, this is a method. It has been devised by Jonathan Pritchard, a, a, a student of a friend of mine who's from Stanford, Mike Feldman. Um, and uh, the method helps you to distinguish if you want to call them races, you know. Except we have no idea how many races there are, how many groups. Races are sub subdivisions of a species. What is a species? Maybe we should start with that. You probably all know it. Anyhow, a species is a group of individuals that can reproduce between themselves and have fertile progeny. So it's those that can continue the species, because if two individuals cannot reproduce the species, if you take an ass and a donkey and a, and a horse, they give very good uh, children. They may even show hybrid vigor, because they're real hybrids, which are mules and, uh, and other uh, types of uh, animals, but they don't reproduce. They are sterile, because uh, that's what happens when you cross individuals from two different species that are too far for their DNA to work well together. So, uh, we all, all humans are equally fertile with any other group of humans because we really separated only 100,000 years ago. And uh, uh, 100,000 years ago is extremely little in terms of evolution. It takes at least a million years in order to have two separate species, at least. Although, as some conditions, there are changes that can happen in one generation when, for instance, a genome multiplies into two. You go from diploid to tetraploid, from two, two to four genomes in one generation. Those species cannot have fertile progeny between themselves. 
And so uh, a, f a species can also rise in such a revolutionary way. But ordinarily, it happens slowly, and uh, it takes uh, sort of a million years. Now, this is a way to distinguish how many races there might be in humans and do it statistically in the right way. Uh, you decide first how many, how many races do you want, and then you'll go and see which is more satisfactory. So you start with two. Now, the method takes all the 1,000 individuals of the HGDP and uh, draws it as an horizontal line. And uh, having decided to separate the um, whole world into two races, it then tell, uh, gives to the two races a different color. And it also shows you, in ways that are convincing mathematically, that some of the individuals are inevitably mixed. Right? They, they are mixed, and uh, therefore, one of these lines is about 60% yellow, and the rest uh, sort of purple. And uh, now, the yellow one is found in Africa, Europe, Northern Africa, Western Asia. Here, it tends to be more mixed. This is Central and South Asia. But if you go to East Asia, you have a predominance of the purple type. Now, if you go on to, this is not a very good subdivision of the world. So let's proceed and make three individuals. Three individuals are, three races, I'm sorry. Three races show a distinction of what was previously yellow into two parts. And the one part that separates is Africa. But it uh, separates from Europe and a uh, part of Asia. But the east of Asia and the rest of the world, this is America and Oceania, always indigenous people. And uh, it still has a lot of that mixture. Now, um, here you go on to uh, four. This is two, three, and four. And here you have a fourth separation appearing. And clearly, it is this one that is split into two. And that splits Central Asia from Europe and West Asia, which remains here. And then on you go, you try with five. And then you see that here there appears a separation of one group that here was not separated, which is Melanesians and Papuans, the only representatives of Oceania that we have, another continent. And, uh, but it doesn't separate Americans. In order to separate Americans, you have to k equals six. Now, I'll show you later another I'll show where none of these is really satisfactory. You always have a lot of admixtures, right? But there's some tendency to say, well, the continents are somewhat separated, except that the separation, from, for instance, from Europe from Asia does not happen along the Urals. It happens further east and further so that it happens where the Himalaya is. That's a big barrier. And all north of the Himalaya, there are also some deserts. And so it's very difficult to go across except in at the level of north, the extreme north of Siberia. So uh, Asia tends to be separated in two or three or four more parts, depending on how many you want to take. And of course, we here we stopped with seven. Now, this was done with a special type of mm, genes that are called microsatellites. Microsatellites are st uh, stutterings of the gene. When a, Sometimes when genes are duplicated, they like a stutterer, you know, you say to repeat the same syllable or whatever. And uh, gene, DNA also makes the same mistake. And it may repeat two or three or four times. And there are stutterers that may go on and on and on repeating uh, the same uh, a syllable or the same part of the word. Well, uh, microsatellites are very good genes. They have a fairly high frequency. They are probably not subject to much natural selection, except a small minority of them has a very bad habit. And you all, those of you who know about the genetic code will understand why. Those microsatellites that involve three nucleotides in a row correspond to one amino acid when you go from DNA to protein. Now, when, those three, uh, when there's a stuttering of those three, then in the protein, an amino acid is repeated two, three, four, five times. Well, when that happens, in very critical parts of a protein, then uh, it's a disaster. One of the worst diseases, which is Huntington's career, it's very bad because it happens 
for the best part of life, between 40 and 50 years, you become mad and die very, very badly. And uh, it takes uh, 10 years to do that. And uh, if you have one a parent that has the same disease, one parent, then you have 50% chance of dying exactly in that way. So it's a terrible disease, Huntington's Korea. Well, that is due to a microsatellite free that continues to multiply even during the growth of a person and therefore continues to produce a protein which is important for the brain that makes uh, always the same amino acid and kind of function. And there are several other mutations like that. But basically, the majority of microsatellite mutations are totally on, um, have no effect uh, that can be observed. So there are 783 microsatellites over all the chromosomes have been examined here. Each had 10 or so different forms. So almost 8,000 different forms of genes were considered to establish this work. And some more interesting work was done that I'm going to tell you. And that is what I think is a very, mm, uh, this is a paper that was done with uh, an Indian PhD from a student who has just now gone to Harvard. And um, so he and Ramachandran, and we did it at Stanford. And uh, we, we looked at the difference between the 52 populations of uh, the LGDP. Um, in pairs. So we have about 1,200 pairs or co comparisons between two populations. And they were plotted, the, di the difference for one microsatellite, one of the 783 microsatellites for all, uh, um, they were compared with um, uh, so it's, it's, I'm sorry, it compares them between uh, 52 uh, populations in pairs for all the microsatellites, taking considerably the distance, the difference between for all microsatellites, the genetic difference. We call it genetic distance. And that is indicated here and also here. Now, the difference between these two curves is the way the geographic distance between the populations are calculated. This is calculated as the crow flies. So that, for instance, that between Australia, Australian Aborigines, and uh, South American Indians is uh, calculated across the Pacific. But that's not the way the, the migration went. It went through the Bering Strait. If we take that into account, then we have this graph, which is much nicer. Obviously, um, and uh, also we included some other forced waypoints. Way uh, and uh, that improves considerably. The correlation we have here between geographic distance between two of the population and their genetic difference with these six, 783 microsatellites is one of the highest correlations I've seen in, in biology. It's 0.89. And we repeated it later with more genes of a different kind, and we find 0.91. So it really is a very extremely high correlation. And, um, but there are some points that are far. Now, the red points are all within a continent. Now, these are almost all include one African population, which is one of those that has more difference. And the reason why it has more difference between the African themselves and between Africans and non-Africans, well, but especially between Africans and themselves, is that they have been there for a longer time, for 100,000 years, and they have diverged more, while everybody else has been separated for less than 50,000 years because the world has been occupied in the last 50,000 years, starting from Africa, East Africa being the source. The green, so all these are individuals from the same continent. So these are between two Africans, and uh, these are between maybe two Europeans or two, etc. Now, those are the shortest distances being in the same continent, right? But then you take one from, here you, the greens are all the old world, Europe, Asia, Africa. And here the, the rule in calculating those red dots is the distance between one individual who is in Europe and one is in Asia, Asia or in Africa. Th that is individuals, two individuals from different old world continents, right? Well, you can see that uh, 
The correlation continues to be there with some little differences that I won't explain. And then the, the, the um, purple uh, points there are uh, cases in which one of the two countries is either America or Ocean, the Mo Oceania. Those are the most distant uh, countries in the world from everything else, right? And so the, genetic dis the great geographic distance is greatest and the genetic distance is also very great. Now, this very good, great correlation means what really makes superpopulations different is how far they are and why. Well, the only reasonable one thing could be where well, they are and live in the same environment, in different environments. But, you know, these, in each of these, there are extraordinarily different environments. In, in, uh, but uh, they are still, if the, difference, if the difference in environments is extreme, then also the geographic distance is fairly important. What is very important is that when two populations are very close geographically, they exchange a lot um, at marriage or in other ways. Well, uh, that is migration, the fourth measure. So here, the correlation is generated by the fact that if two populations are separated much, then they will differentiate, mostly because of drift, also because of natural selection, but not so much. Natural selection would not cause such a simple picture, and uh, because it varies according to places. And uh, um, um, migration tends to bring, again, tends to eliminate the, the divergence created by drift. So the two things go one against the other. So a large population with large N number of individuals and one uh, population with a lot of migration gets in a lot um, are going to be very little variable. So N and M are two factors that have the same effect. And that is the measure that determines essentially this, uh, the slope. And now we have done this same uh, curve. So why, but uh, there's another important thing that has been found, and that is on the same data. <laughs> My fault, but I'm not going to take it except there were. No, I'll have to take it out because I, I have forgotten how to use this and I'm not sure how to close it. <laughs> but I may be able to do it now. Now I've managed. Then there's something we discovered and uh, we, uh, has been discovered uh, also by other people at the same time, which is called the serial founder effect. And that is, remember that um, we have had this, this migration from here towards the rest of the world, right? So at every migration meant that uh, at the beginning there were populations that were growing, they were becoming too many, and so they would send people out. Uh, there, some would prefer to go out, uh, to go into the unknown as long as they could find some decent place and not have to struggle with their uh, relatives or non-relatives. And therefore, this has created a lot of colonies, one after the other, always a little further away, right? And uh, every colony involved a founder effect because there was a small number of founders, so it provoked the drift, so it provoked loss of genetic diversity. And, uh, but it has been a progressive, a serial effect that the further you were, you were from the beginning, the number of these colony, foundation of colonies, insisted. Now, that has been tested in the following way. Using the uh, same 52 colonies of the AGDP, population of the AGDP, what we calculated is the genetic diversity of each population. How do you do that? Well, if... Um, if you took and if you had another man, not Craig Venter, and he was, for instance, a, a, a child of an African and an American, an American Indian, who are the most different, distant populations in the world, he would have more differences between the contribution of the father and the mother, that hybrid, right? Well, so if you can just count the number of differences, like we did count for Craig Venter, unfortunately, 
for, we were able to do it for all the genome, only in the case of one person, Craig Winter. We will know more because it will become more fashionable. I think Jim Watson also wants to have his genome tested. But anyhow, um, the, and now there is actually a plan to do a thousand individuals for the whole world, but it, uh, it's still not, not the, using old data, essentially. And um, if you count the number of differences, if it is true that having sending progeny out in a small numbers of founders lose diversity because of drift, right? Then you should continuously lose diversity. Well, these are the 52 populations. Diversity, these are Africans. They are, this is the distance from the place of origin. That we have taken Addis Ababa as place of origin, just as. Well, you know, this is a very close correlation. And uh, these are all African populations, which are closest, or Middle East. And then you keep going, Europe, this is all the others. These are Oce American Indians, and these are Oceanians, and so on. And you can see that they lose gradually diversity. You lose heterozygosity. Now, we have redone this on a much larger. These are 8,000 forms from the 783. 10 forms each. And now we have done it on 100 times more nucleotides. And uh, we get exactly the same result. In fact, we get a greater uh, slope. We have done it on a Y chromosome, which has more, has only one chromosome instead of four. And we have a bigger slope. It's more complicated. So this we call the serial founder effect. This is a simulation. Imagine that there were 100 steps of founding of new colonies. There could have been 500, 300, we don't know. Just assume 100, which is anthropologically not absurd. And then you can see that uh, it gives a result. This is calculated so it has the same slope as that. And here, the correlation also is extremely high. So this was a pleasant result. And uh, if you try to look, use those data to calculate which, which you think is, has been the origin of the world, the highest correlation is obtained that gives the red value. So you have the highest correlation when you imagine that the origin of all the modern humans is here. I think that it really is probably more in that direction, but we don't have enough data with the 52 populations. We would need much more data. And the worst uh, idea is, of course, and archaeologists, of course, know that this is last arrived and these are first on the scene for a very long time. So it corresponds exactly. And then, well, this is a correlation between genes and languages. Now, what I'm, I'm showing here, if there's any journalist, I would pray you not to mention it on a newspaper, because we are, um, this is a, a paper we, we, we have written at Stanford, a group of us, and uh, using 625,000 nucleotides, which is a lot. <laughs> And uh, it's um, half as much as the greatest number you can use at the moment, uh, unless you do sequencing. Now, th this costs uh, eight or nine hundred dollars, thousand dollars per individual. So on thousand individuals, it's a million dollars. It was not so easy to find it, but, and uh, and we, it is only half of what we could have done, which would have costed not quite twice as much, but um, almost. So still, it's the largest number that has ever been tested, or ever the largest. Uh, number of individuals in the world, 1,000 individuals, when it will be possible to look at uh, the whole genome, it will be better. But I can notice that the results that we get from the 780 from microsatellites are fairly similar, although there are some differences. Now, well, this is very interesting. Um, I have only a few things to show. I hope that I can. Can I continue a little bit? Uh, can I continue another five or 10 minutes? Is it OK? Now, uh, this is from the data that I'm afraid I, I should not be used for, for newspapers if there is a journalist here, because it's embargoed by the, by the journal to which we have sent these data. And they are not yet published. They will be, but uh, until then, they should not be used. Now, um, uh, Luantin, a very bright geneticist, has made one important calculation. He's made a very simple statistical method called analysis of variance. He has subdivided the variation among human populations known 30 years ago uh, on proteins, totally different methods. 
And he uh, took 12 populations from around the world, compared them, and said, what is the difference between being born in two different populations or being born in the same population? And he found that the difference within a population <laughs> is uh, the majority. So populations are made of great, there is a great diversity in every population which is very similar among populations. And it's 85% in his estimate. So the difference among the populations that he examined was 15%. They were very far away, you know, and, uh, and he found 15%. <laughs> then other computations were made, and they vary, varied between 15 and 10 and 5, etc. Now, this is done on the 625,000 data. And this is what is one of the things that is, uh, uh, um, I think it's interesting. The division was made in three parts. The blue part is the variation between, not continents, but the seven groups that are better than continents, which I'll show you in a minute, between seven so-called races, if you want to call them races. And this is the rest that you add if you consider the 50 populations, so that the difference between those races is the greatest part, because they are all very close ge geographically. If you add the differences between populations within the same continent, so to say, or race, or whatever you want to cluster, we call it clusters, and uh, then you add this very small amount. Right. Now, these are value estimates for different chromosomes. The 23 chromosomes, you can see they are very precise. We really are getting biology into an exact science. And this, I think, is an important advance. And uh, it's due to the fact that we use 100,000 10,000 more information than before. And so statistics teaches us that the error goes down. And it does go down in an important way, so that now we can make statements that are much stronger than, than we could make before. Now, there's one chromosome which is abnormal, X chromosome. Well, very simple reason. It's, uh, it, uh, now, this quantity you can see on average is about 10%, right? Here, it's about 15%, maybe a little less. Well, there's a very good reason. Simply, if you take a, a pair of humans that make a child, there are, for every chromosome, there are four numbers, four of them, but for the X is only three, because man is only one. So the precision, in terms of this, to keeping the genetic diversity, is three to four, in the case of X chromosome. So, and therefore, the X chromosome must have a greater genetic diversity, and it has exactly the amount that you expect, approximately at least. Well, uh, from considering that there are three X chromosomes and uh, four all other chromosomes per individual. Now, and this is mitochondria. Mitochondria are very small chromosomes, but uh, they are bacterial chromosomes. They have nothing to do with our chromosomes. They are very important differences, and yet they have their own diversity. So this is, mitochondria also tell us about diversity. Now, there's one important thing, of course. These two don't, I'm sorry, uh, Y chromosomes are not shown here uh, because we, had not, we don't have enough data. But uh, there is more, there's more difference. So this is higher for Y chromosomes. Um, uh, mitochondria uh, and Y chromosomes don't have the other important source of diversity, which is recombination. Make uh, sex. So if you and if you want to know, ask why is there sex? Well, why do so many organisms want to have sex? Well, the reason is, according to uh, a good, uh, there is a relatively good consensus about this. The reason is that uh, uh, sex increases the diversity. It is. It produces. Hybrids, <laughs> and hybrids have greater diversity, and then the hybrids separate by recombination. Their pieces of chromosomes um, get together and uh, uh, exchange pieces and so on. That process of recombination, as it is called, is very important in evolution, and it gives diversity. Diversity allows to overcome new situations, so that being uh, having sex means you are more ready to fight difficult situations. And, and, and what are the difficult situations that we encounter? 
that uh, therefore uh, have generated, given great, great importance to sex. Well, it's not the pleasure that derives from sex. Of, on the contrary, it's why the pleasure that derives from sex is what stimulates us to, to have sex so that sex has the beneficial effect at the level of natural selection. And the reason, the great the reason, according to Bill Hamilton, who is a, a very a good uh, student of evolution, it is due to the fight with parasites. The, the greatest uh, challenge is not from changes in the environment. The greatest challenge is, well, I hope it's true, that we shouldn't think that, that globalization is nothing, you know, because uh, I said that the challenge of the environment is not the greatest one. Uh, the, cha the greatest challenge is parasites. And parasites really are the greatest danger, those that keep our, uh, generate the majority of dangers and uh, well, it is true. Uh, we know that by fighting parasites, we have brought the uh, expectation of life from 20 years, as it was 200 years ago, to 78, 80, right? Uh, and so that's a, a major advance. And uh, uh, it means that mortality has almost disappeared. Uh, I don't think it, will, it can disappear completely. It's very, I suspect that uh, it's impossible. But uh, it's... Uh, clear that uh, uh, the abolition of the fight, uh, success in the fights of parasites. The real problem is that parasites fight with the same weapons with which we fight. They fight with mutation, new mutations. And they are accumulating a lot of mutations. And uh, those mutations are making the antibiotics much less effective than they used to be. And uh, they and we cannot produce now enough antibiotics to keep track uh, of, of what they are doing with their own mutation system. So the mutations that we can produce in antibiotics by inventions right, are not going. So we have to think of other ways. And uh, there are things that are very dangerous, like using, for instance, antibiotics for growth of animals because the animals grow bigger. Well, those generate more mutations to resistance in, that, in bacteria. And those will end uh, minimizing the power of antibiotics. So we really have to grow in wisdom and in using our resources with very great... Uh, so, and I believe that uh, genetics is very important for these reasons because it really can tell us many things that we, we should better learn. Now, one th quick thing. Repeating with the uh, hundred times more individuals, the same. We I showed you with six on seven, with six races so called. Right now with six races, situation was not very good. While it looked like uh, we were separating before on, on microsatellite, we are separating these uh, uh, races. Well, well, now that you have more information, we see that there is a lot more of variation. These are uh, the Middle Easterns. And they have, Africa stands alone, and America stand alone. They are the most extreme ones, geographically. All the rest, and uh, uh, chi this is almost all, all China, you know. Uh, these populations have not been chosen randomly, as it would be nice. They have been chosen by the fact that there were uh, interested geneticists who were able to do to work in China, or in Pakistan, or in, in Israel, and so on. And we could get those samples, therefore. But um, um, so this homogeneity of China is uh, completely superficial. And the homogeneity of Africa is also due to the fact that there is a lot of variation in Africa, but they're all much concentrated because they, they've had a lot of evolution. And uh, together compared with these, uh, uh, and but you can see the majority of these populations are even more, more mixed now that we have examined more genes than we were able to examine before. So that uh, the um, idea that races are, can be pure is a very stupid idea and very counterproductive. Now, I'm going to show you, though, that uh, there are, well, I suspect that I'd better stop. Uh, it's, I don't think I have the time to follow these. So I apologize, and I would like to thank you for listening to me and for inviting me here. Thank you very much.
I'm happy to answer questions. I'm happy to answer questions if you want. If you want. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Luca. It was uh, really a wonderful uh, expose and a, a wonderful panorama. And so uh, up to date also. So up to date, it is not even published yet. No. <laughs> the, but we have already sent the data to uh, all the results uh, on the internet because this is one of the things that is requested for using the internet. I'm sure there are many questions that we we'll want to be asked, and so we'll. Uh, yes. Continue. Can you can you answer? Need a microphone. I'd like to ask something more about the story of Adam and Eve because I, I didn't really Adam? understand Adam and Eve. I mean, Adam I didn't really Eve, understand yes. how this came about. Yes. I mean, since every bo every other Adam but yes. him uh, yes. uh, disappeared. I mean, is it possible that he also would have disappeared and we just wouldn't exist? Or I mean, why is it? No. Why is no. it that we have just one Adam and one Eve and not one Adam and three Eves? Or anyway, can you say something more about all this, please? Uh, sure. Thanks. Well, what I can tell you is that. Whenever, whenever people, whenever people are, I think I that I'm still there. Whenever people are alive, they have a common ancestor, and uh, you only trace the last common ancestor in this way. And the, there is only one last common ancestor always, because in any case, um, even if there were many other people at the same time living there, simply because the 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 Y chromosome, not the rest, but only the Y chromosome of that individual uh, uh, is the only one that is, whose descendants are represented today. All the others have had descendants, but they died at some time or other before today. So, um, so but the, the other Adams may have contributed other genes outside the oh white yes, room, so exactly. that's probably what you were asking. Yes, <laughs> that is correct. I'm glad, thank you for point, pointing that, that point, making that point. Yes? Uh, what is the current uncertainty on the age of the first ancestors? Uh, and does it depend on the size of human population over the history and prehistory? Or is it this uncertainty negligible? Uh, I, would, I would think that the, the size of the human population is of importance. And um, there are actually, the, the theory is, um, and the methods are fairly clear cut, so that you can see. You can, you can see what factors are important. The factors of the greatest importance, probably, is the variation in the number of children. And uh, one extreme case for you, instead of saying the whole uh, species, there's one case in which uh, 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 a very good human geneticist examined a large population of American Indians in Brazil. And he found one population in which there was one um, individual, one chief in the village, and the village was made of, say, uh, 80 people or so, he had, including the children, he had, had all, the, all the women were his wives, and the others were not allowed, supposedly, to, well, whatever happened in, in the forest, you know, was more difficult to guess. However, you know, with DNA, you, you could tell, but, but um, uh, the uh, the result was that this man, he was the last, the common ancestor, the Adam of that village. So there was, the uh, Adam uh, was one generation old, okay? That's an extreme case. And it depends only on the variation of the number of children. That's probably the most important factor. Since I don't see any hands raised, I'll ask you a question. Uh, in, in, I think in the last... Uh, color figure you showed, uh, there were all the, all the European population of the same color, yes. ra rather homogeneous, except the Tuscan population, which had a little trace of Middle Eastern genes. Yes. Is it a remnant of the Etruscan origins? Yes, uh, yes, yes that's the only simple explanation we can give. In fact, you know, I always like to have a control. There is even a control, because if you take Tuscan cattle, it looks like Turkish cattle. Did you know that? No, that doesn't. Well, yeah, maybe it's not published yet. It's been done at Piacenza. The, uh, the, uh, you mean the, the Chianina is different? Oh, the, 
the Tuscan cattle that have been examined are different from the other Italian cattle, and they are more like the Turkish cattle. And, you know, uh, this had been uh, used before in the sense that, uh, as a criterion, for instance, uh, no, Isle, uh, Iceland, uh, Icelanders came in, in part from Norway, and in part from slaves they raided, were other, were other origin. But um, the, their surnames are all from one region of, of Norway, which is in the middle, more or less, between Bergen and Trondheim. Well, their cattle has genes that also come from that region. <laughs> so, you know, uh, the, the, it's very interesting to have a possibility of a control from another species. Well, yes. I would like the, to ask if there is any uh, genetic evidence about the theories uh, of, uh, about uh, multiple migration into Americas, that is, uh, the theories about uh, the Kenwick men uh, and the uh, Mesa Verde findings. Well, th there is a, a problem in the sense that uh, uh, the, the good uh, the good archaeological data are very few. Um, there are some uh, claims that there were some older, older settlements, especially in the South, in South America. And that is a discussion among archaeologists. Uh, there are some difficulties in obtaining specimens because, uh, you know, some uh, the respect for one census is a very powerful uh, sentiment, and it's, it has, uh, one has to be very careful with that, uh, because people really feel that uh, it's, their ancestors are their own property, and you, cannot, you shouldn't touch them unless you don't want them. So there are some mummies in South America that might tell us a lot of things. And um, so far, it's not been possible to, to use them. So we have to overcome prejudice or, or give up knowing these results, the, these conclusions, because uh, it's, um, I'm for respecting ideas of people, sometimes even if they are somewhat crazy. But uh, you know, I think that uh, it's, uh, you, you have to respect individual freedom. But isn't there some, uh, uh, also, you didn't mention, talk about that, but some linguistic evidence for three different yes. group, linguistic languages? Oh, yeah, I'm glad you're in, yes. in, in, in there, America. Now, Greenberg has proposed that there were three different migrations. Uh, one, the first, uh, went all the way to South America and was the earliest. The second stopped uh, mostly in, um, in parts of North America. And uh, the third was that of Eskimos, who are especially uh, settled only on the Arctic coast and live very special, and they were the last. Archaeologically, also, the Eskimos are clearly the last. Now, uh, it, there is a good correspondence with genetic data of that idea. Uh, the only problem is the variation, the genetic variation in South America is extreme, so that, uh, but that is expected of a population that has been made by very small groups for a long time, you know, so that you would expect that to happen. So there's nothing surprising. I believe that uh, the linguistic data and the genetic data are very much in agreement. And in fact, that is written on the, on the book that um, was mentioned. In the 94 book of History and Geography of Human Genes, there are the data of that. Those data are based on proteins. Now, I haven't seen data on DNA yet, but um, in, and there are some limitations to working on DNA with uh, American Indian data, especially in the United States. But there are some very interesting things that could come out. Anyhow, the general picture you get is in quite in agreement with the linguistic migration suggested by Greenberg. You have to realize, though, that the linguists don't always agree with Greenberg's suggestion. Although Greenberg was certainly one of the greatest linguists of the last century, they were very um, antagonistic to, um, to Greenberg's ideas about evolution, especially the American linguists. The American linguists 
have a strange attitude towards classifying languages. They think, I find it strange at least, that they are the only ones who think that um, this is true, this is found in the literature, that uh, in order to understand how similar are two languages, you can at most hope to study two languages during a lifetime so that you understand them so well. If you can say if they are related or not. They don't have absolutely the idea that there are various degrees of relationship, right? Absolutely, mm, this is foreign to them. One of them is very proud of having studied three American languages in depth. But of course, if you study only two languages, you cannot establish a, a, a taxonomy. There's no way. And uh, therefore, uh, it's much, much, much more difficult. So uh, I believe that the question of American linguistics is at the moment hopeless until there will be a change in the general hostility among uh, linguists, among themselves, but especially with, with Greenberg's ideas. Greenberg unfortunately died, so he's not there to uh, fight for his ideas. You need more the immigration of more Russian Jewish linguists into America <laughs> to make uh, to make it easier. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, I, I don't know, he's not a Jew, but he's Russian. But, many, but he died, unfortunately. He's a very good, very good linguist. Well, uh, uh, Luca, you are still full of energy and fresh, but the audience is exhausted. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we thank you very much no, again. I think, Everybody, you, I think there are no more questions. <laughs> I think the value of